It's my pleasure to introduce Bill Salman, who's the Baker Foundation Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. Um, Bill Salman has been a faculty at Harvard Business School since 1980, and basically created the entrepreneurial program at, at Harvard Business School. He's been instrumental in a number of the key projects at Harvard, including the stem cell um, initiative, as well as with their labs. He's uh, written over 200 cases that have been used um, at, at the Harvard Business School. Uh, he's an active angel investor. I think he's invested in over something like 400 companies, something like that, a lot. But, um, and I also just say as a side, um, he's also been somebody who I've uh, admired for a very, very long time, so it's a, it's a real treat to have him here sharing his knowledge and his insights with us. Um, one just other kind of note, that there's a long list of accomplishments of Bill, and he's, he's an impact on a number of great businesses and entrepreneurs, you know, I could go on and on. But just uh, as, a, as a one bit of tribute to him, in uh, 2011, the National uh, Venture Capital Association gave him the American Spirit Award, which goes to the uh, person who has shown outstanding leadership by applying business skills, knowledge, expertise, resources to make a meaningful contribution to society. So, in any event, um, really, really thrilled to have Bill here. And uh, with no further ado, Bill Salmon. By the way, he's a comedian, too. Uh, thank you, Michael, and uh, you know that uh, the affection is shared with you and Deborah. Uh, big fan of what you've been doing for a long time. Uh, look, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm normally taking a nap about this time, so I'm just hopeful we can get through this uh, without me drifting off. Also, I'm a little worried uh, because the first part of this talk is going to sound a little pessimistic. Uh, I'll try to end on an up note, uh, but I think it's uh, useful to get an image of what's really going on in the U.S. and the degree to which we individually and collectively have to own the problem and try to come up with solutions. And what I admire so much about the group here, uh, and Michael and Deborah and others, is just you're out there on the front lines. Um, and so I, I, I hope I can be helpful a bit, and we'll talk about entrepreneurship, but uh, I so admire what you're doing. I will uh, just go through this uh, little background. The, it's 190 companies, not 400. Uh, if you ask me to name the 190 companies, just not going to happen. I will say, however, uh, that you know we always have trouble getting cases on companies that fail. And so I decided to vertically integrate into that. Um, and I have this unbelievable collection of crash letters. Um, I actually have some non-crash letters where they never acknowledged uh, that they had lost the money. So we'll try to give some example of what I've learned. And then for the past 10 or 11 years, I've focused on uh, these big areas in the economy that are going to affect us and our grandchildren and their grandchildren. Uh, in particular, I spent a lot of time on health care. I read the Affordable Care Act. I'm it. No one in Congress read the Affordable Care Act, and we'll talk about that. Um, I just want to point out that I, I spent four years of my life uh, working to make this ubiquitous. Uh, I have not seen any for several years, and this was a company I invested in, and I got a letter, Dear Former Shareholder. So just to give you a sense of what it's like to go through the entire cycle, Dear Former Shareholder, we went through nine CEOs. Uh, $250 million, and then the guy who bought the uh, company actually was riding in Scotland and inadvertently went off the cliff and died. <laughs> so um, you need to get all um, wings of the distribution to have knowledge. Uh, I also invested in a fat-free potato chip company, 
And I, I just tell you, all of the taste is in the fat. <laughs> so um, the other thing I learned was really difficult to compete with Frito-Lay, just so you know. There's the Segway crossing the chasm. Now, the other thing that I've observed, uh, and the only benefit of actually of going older, is that you've seen a lot of things, and things that you thought, okay, I know where that one's going. So this guy, I took a real estate class with this guy. He was unbelievably well prepared. He was articulate. He was smart. He was a JD MBA. And then when he would end up as Mitt Romney, completely understandable. But that this person who was in the same class would end up as president of the United States. So there are just a lot of things that can happen. And you should keep that in mind. Now the big speech I've been giving lately uh, is called intergenerational robbery. It's a terribly uplifting speech. Um, and it's sort of based on the de Tocqueville statement that the republic will last until politicians learn to use the people's money to bribe the people. Uh, I actually have a picture of my granddaughter and her response to what's going on. I inserted a later picture of my granddaughter because she no longer looks that way, uh, but not because uh, of what's going on in politics. But I'll try to talk a bit about an assessment of what's really going on and then what we have to do. Uh, so Woody Allen, uh, I think, uh, described very accurately the crossroads we're at <laughs> and uh, what we need to get beyond it. And I had looked uh, to try to find that Venn diagram that captured both of those uh, avenues, and uh, I did find <laughs> someone. And then uh, I just want to point out he went to Wharton. <laughs> I don't know why I would find that important. Uh, Mitt Romney asked that his grades be distributed to the public, and apparently Donald said, I will sue you. Okay, to remind everyone, uh, in fact, uh, political, uh, political discourse has not always been very uplifting. Uh, this was uh, a description uh, of Adams, hideous hermaphroditical character. But it turns out uh, that a mean-spirited, low-lived fellow, the son of a half-breed Indian squaw, sired by... It was tough back then, too. <laughs> I was not around for this one but just to remind us. So here's my assessment of the three threats to the uh, American dream. Uh, the first is health cost and quality. We spend $10,000 per person, twice what is spent anywhere in the developed world. It's 18% of gross domestic products, $3.2 trillion this year and we have mediocre or poor outcomes. Now remember that the political statement is we have the best healthcare system in the world. I just want you to focus on that set of facts. Uh, in education, we spend at least 50% more than a number of countries, uh, and we have also mediocre outcomes. So these, I think, and we'll describe them as the great taxes that are hidden on the American economy and on hope. Uh, it also turns out the U.S. has already spent all the money. Uh, they have agreed to pay Medicare. They've agreed to pay Social Security. They've agreed to pay for uh, repairs that have to happen across the entire economy. And effectively, we have no fiscal or monetary weapons left. We could increase spending, um, but it's hard to know how you can do it when you're running a budget deficit that is growing each and every year. This is the uplifting part of this speech. You know, I promise we'll get to better stuff. 
So let me talk about healthcare. I tried in one paragraph to describe everything that characterizes our healthcare system. The most important part is that we sort of reward inputs and we don't measure outcomes. And the people who are in the system don't know what things cost and they don't know what the quality is and the entire system frankly conspires to keep that true. So I will also describe healthcare and education as being the self-aggrandizing uh, entities that take on a life all of their own and the only people who are left out of the equation are the patients or the students. So that's going to be the basic argument. We also, by the way, just have a, a, acute and sickness intervention. Well, we'll get to it. Giant hairball of perverse incentives. That's what you get when you have a PhD in economics. You can describe things tersely, uh, and that'll turn out to be true in education as well. And it's not because someone sat down and said, how can I have the highest cost, lowest quality healthcare system in the world? It's the result of inadvertent moves, typically of one group trying to get power in negotiations relative to another group. So hospitals getting bigger so they could negotiate with insurance companies or doctors groups banning together so that they could negotiate against the other group. And again, as all of this grab for value took place, cost went up because it wasn't in anybody's best interest to lower cost or to measure outcomes. That's the system we live in. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, now um, I'll describe it, 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 by the way, I may actually believe in a single payer system. So this is not a political uh, rave against having government involvement. The government already pays more than half the cost. But we had reform of access to health insurance, not reform of access to affordable health. And I think the important point I would make about education, about healthcare, is simply you want an outcome in which people are capable citizens, able of self-actualizing and of realizing their dream, of imagining they can do better than their parents did. You want healthy people who, for God's sake, don't go into a hospital. Hospital is the most dangerous place you can go. The third leading cause of death in the United States is health care, which is not, that's not good. I read the Affordable Care Act. I just want to give you a sense of how it was created. There was one paragraph that struck me. It said, we will not allow the ratio of premiums for older people uh, to younger people to be greater than two to one. So basically, if someone was 55, you couldn't charge them more than two times the insurance rate for a 25-year-old. Now, just as a question, do you think that the cost of a 60-year-old are more than two times the cost of a 25-year-old? Quick guess. This is a little IQ test. Good. We're good. <laughs> Who wrote that? into the act, AARP. It was cut and pasted from AARP. The final act had it at three to one. Is three to one the right ratio? Turns out not. So part of the reason we're in trouble now is that the pool effectively is worse than they imagine because young people don't want to join it. Old people say this is the best deal ever. Old sick people. So now the pool gets worse, so they have to raise rates, and so then the pool gets worse, and then the whole thing is beginning to crash down. Uh, also, and I will say this exactly true of education, that healthcare probably is only a 20% determinant of your health at any moment in time. And there's so many other factors that if you just try to intervene at the point of healthcare, you have no chance of actually having healthy people or changing behavior. Uh, what we did in the Affordable Care Act, we added 30 million people to a system that arguably is $70 trillion in the hole. That would be the present value of expected costs minus the present value of revenues. Medicare is a great deal because they 
charge much less than the actuarial cost of the people entering Medicare. It's a transfer my, from my granddaughter and yours uh, to older people, which I'm in favor of now. <laughs> Education. Again, you start with this fundamentally terrific idea about public education and citizens who can play a positive role in the country, and they design it in a certain way that may work okay in the time period that it's there, but ultimately doesn't change as the world changes. You have limited engagement with families, and since ultimately education and becoming a productive citizen is a function of your environment and of your family and all sorts of things, if we don't include them in a process focused on outcomes, we're not going to uh, win. We spend 50% of our dollars on administration. We have massive sets of rules. You know, again, in healthcare and education, if you looked at the book that describes what you're supposed to do and the degree to which your actions are circumscribed, it's just a disaster. And then the beast decides, I'm going to keep competition out. I'm going to describe it as dangerous. I'm going to make sure that nurses can't compete with doctors. I'm going to make sure that teaching assistants can't do things that only... I'm going to make sure that you have to have a master's in education in order to teach in a public school. I'm going to do a lot of things that ultimately sound okay, but have the unintended consequence of protecting the beast from change. Um, in Massachusetts, I think last year... Uh, Paul or others may have better ideas. I think there are only three teachers who were fired for cause. Yeah, that seems low. <laughs> I mean, we fired more people at Harvard Business School uh, and probably didn't do as much as we should have. Um, Everybody knows these statistics. This is the worst set of statistics um, I've ever seen, which have to do with the consequences of not uh, graduating from high school. And just when you look at these figures, this has to be among the most concerning statistics uh, that we observe about our educational system. So what do healthcare and education have in common? No productivity gains, limited disruption. My friend uh, Clay Christensen, and I am required to quote both Clay Christensen and Michael Porter. Good to go. Um, limited disruption. That everything we have seen in almost every industry in the world has not taken place in these industries. Uh, the beast, I don't know what 666 means, but... I'm told if you read the Bible carefully, it's not good. And it could be 616, I'm not sure. Incentives, all wrong. No cost understanding. Again, you look in a hospital, how do they allocate costs? Well, they allocate costs based on revenues. Or they allocate costs based on something like maximizing the loss in the emergency room because they get political credit for serving uninsured people. It's unrelated to the cost of doing it. It's simply related to uh, some way to get more money for the system. Um, buying process screwed up. Unrelated to the end user uh, or health outcomes, it's got all this complexity and opacity to it. And then I think the one that should scare us most and we heard a discussion of the possibilities of artificial intelligence uh, and a big data analysis, we throw away petabytes of data every day. In other words, in healthcare, you might imagine that our electronic health records are collecting data on the basis of which we get to predict your health or imagine interventions. Nothing could be further from the truth. And so in education, we have thousand, we have 55 million kids in K through 12. We've got 20 million kids in higher education. And you basically don't anywhere analyze or assess those data. And by the way, the government 
in its infinite wisdom, has tried to protect people from the release of those data. So you have HIPAA that I think has done more to harm the potential for patient-centered medicine than almost anything I could imagine. And if people really understood that it would be in their best interest to share those data, carefully anonymized, that they would behave differently. But we've scared them. Um, the other thing I, I want to comment on, because I think it's particularly disturbing in today's political environment. Uh, you have people who are called globalists. To be called a globalist today in politics is to be called a hermaphroditic, I don't even know what that means, something, right? But I want us to look at what has happened around the world because it's actually extraordinary. In the U.S., we've had all of these things take place. I agree. So now what I want you to do is to look at job formation in the past 30 years. So what this chart says, in the last 30 years, we've added 889 million people to the workforce outside of farms. We've added uh, 136 and 43, most of them in the developing countries. So think this is China, India, Brazil, all of these countries, Vietnam, which was out of the system completely. That's a pretty extraordinary performance when you think about bringing people into the possibility of self -determ economic self-determination. The other point is, if you look at global per capita income, it has gone up dramatically over that period of time. This is an enormous success story. You have to almost be racist not to imagine that people outside of the U.S. should not also benefit from economic growth. And so when I hear people talking about how horrible the world is and the U.S. and blah, 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 I note there are 800 billion or million people who have jobs. Now what I want to do is go back and say, how do I think about spending an extra $5,000 per person on health care and an extra $4,000 per person on education. And let's say I combine those in some reasonable way and I come up with $8,000. This is the global distribution of income. And the question I have for you is, for $8,000 a year, how many people in the world would find that attractive? I can't read it either. But the answer is four billion. Five billion people? Now, I want you to tell me how it is that jobs subject to global trading are going to do well in a system in which there are four or five billion people willing to take those jobs for less money than we waste on education and health care. And so if you really want to understand what's going on is we connected the world. We opened up opportunities for people everywhere. We gave them all connections to internet. We have these two billion smartphones. And so the net result is there are no circumstances in which I would have imagined that people in the US in certain kinds of jobs would have thrived during this period. And the next chart captures that perfectly. And I am not going to try to explain that, but it's got a peak and a valley. And the valley says, it was the middle class in the U.S. who didn't participate in the global economic growth. That is Trump land. That is Hillary land. So they're both looking at this and saying, forget what happened around the global economy. It is the fact that a group of people didn't participate, and I will say, as Carol Dweck would say, not yet. So that's going to be an interesting issue. The other point I would make is that the total amount of savings in the economy, global economy, has exploded. So here it says we have $300 trillion of financial assets in the world. $300 trillion. Global gross, uh, gross domestic product is something like $70 trillion. If you worked in finance, I'm sorry about this, Michael and Deborah, 
and you didn't make money during this period, you should have to hand in your degree <laughs> and the keys to your Corolla. Because this is a period during which astonishing things took place around finance and around taking advantage of that increase in supply. So that's a picture of the world. Uh, the U.S., I'll just say, uh, is confronted with having already agreed to uh, expenditures in health care, Social Security, and other things eat up more and more of the budget. And even if we increase the proportion going to taxes, we're facing deficits that turn out to be in the trillions and trillions of dollars. So we don't have, and by the way, on states, uh, actually, this is all um, Illinois. Deborah, Deborah. States are in horrible shape. Not all of them, but most of them. California's in terrible shape because they've agreed to all of this. So the narratives that you see are it's, we're doing, you're doing badly, it's not your fault. Uh, the Democrats have a whole list of things they say are the problem. And Trump and Republicans, these are now separated uh, because one has uh, disassociated uh, with the other, probably correctly. But it's all about illegal immigrants, it's trade, it's taxes are too high, regulations too tough. So, and they, they didn't know how to negotiate deals. Can you tell me where education and health care are in the list? One group says Obamacare is horrible. One group says Obamacare is great. One care says you ought to put more people in Medicare, even though the current reimbursement rates exceed what you get in premiums. None of this has anything to do with solving our problem. So, God, we reach the perigee. We're headed up. When people, this is sort of like uh, Animal House, they've got uh, three tests, they haven't cracked a book, road trip. <laughs> but they say, we're not going to accept this set of possibilities or outcomes. We need to take responsibility, and that's what entrepreneurship is about. So we're going to talk about it, what is it, I will assert that the two greatest inventions of the 20th century were startups and venture capital. And I'm going to say not venture capital like Kleiner Perkins or Andreessen Horowitz, but rather the process of getting money to people trying to change the system in some meaningful way. And I'll have a few examples. So uh, first of all, how do you define entrepreneurship? What's your this audience participation part, what words do you associate with entrepreneurship? State of mind, okay, that's a good one, I like that. Risk, good. Solve problems, okay. Vision, innovation typically comes up. Change, perfect. How many people do you know who get up in the morning and say, where can I find risk? That look around, do a little poll, write down on, the, uh, on Michael's page. <laughs> oh, Michael does. <laughs> look, it's over here. Most people seek reward and they try to manage the risk. So I'm going to talk a lot about managing the relationship between risk and reward. I also note that in many cases, um, People are not particularly innovative. You know, we look at uh, Ray Kroc at McDonald's. Ray went to California. He was a milk, milkshake mixer salesperson. And he discovered these guys with golden arches and cheap hamburgers and uh, french fries and fast food. He took it global. We would call him an entrepreneur, but he certainly wasn't particularly innovative in any meaningful way. So what Howard Stevenson, my colleague, did was he defined entrepreneurship as the pursuit of opportunity beyond the resources currently controlled. And his basic insight was, you have two kinds of people. You have people who try to protect or optimize what they already have, and you have people who say, look, I'm going to focus on opportunities to create and capture value, and I'm going to figure out what resources I need to execute on that idea. 
And so one is sort of administrative trustee-like behavior. One is on the entrepreneurial side. There are a whole series of ways in which they're organized differently. And the greatest insight is, like a mindset, it's a way of managing. It's a way of approaching everything you do. So everything becomes an opportunity. Every problem is an opportunity, and I'll describe that. And I'll assert that the world has become an entrepreneurial hotbed in which nothing is sacred or safe. And ultimately, the rate at which people will change things is accelerating even though the rate of new business formation is going down. So I'll describe what that's about. So uh, as a finance professor, I have to mention that cash is important. That's the only thing people actually learn. Don't run out of cash. That's the only thing they learn in my entire course. But uh, we charge them a lot of money for that. <laughs> so don't tell any young people, right? But it really says the present value of what you get has to exceed what it costs to get there. And you could have a deep trough where it costs a lot of money to get there or something that's slow, but it has to create value that you as an organization can capture. And a social opportunity is the same thing, it's just we measure value and the willingness to invest resources based on people's valuing of the social outcome. And ultimately, you have to have people who are willing to pay you enough, either by giving you money or by paying for some service, uh, that the whole thing makes sense. And I actually don't distinguish between for-profit and not-for-profit. Uh, I think something's an opportunity. It can attract resources or it can't. Uh, it's a way of thinking absolutely everything is an opportunity. So every problem is an opportunity. It's often the answers to questions like, why does it take so long? Why does it cost so much? Why can't I do it this way? It's question-based observation, and the fact that their entrenched competitors is who are trying to protect what they already have is what enables you to do this new thing. So in this regard, every crisis is an opportunity, and I am here to tell you we have an infinite supply. <laughs> that, that if you look across, whether it's in education or environment, uh, anywhere in the world, there are opportunities galore. But the real question is, do people believe they can actually do something? Can they get access to resources? Uh, can they structure experiments? So that's going to be the next thing I'm going to talk about. Can they change and adapt? Because entrepreneurship is about changing and adapting. It's not about predicting. So that's one of the great myths. And the other thing is, um, generally, if societies treat success harshly and treat failure worse, there is no entrepreneurship. In Germany, it used to be if you were the managing director of a company that went bankrupt, you were legally precluded from being the managing director of another company. If you thought you were going to go bankrupt, you had to shut the company down at least nine months before you ran out of money. Whereas in the U.S., it's 90 seconds. <laughs> um, failure in the valley is not a badge of honor. Nobody wants to fail, but there's no diminution in the value of your human capital unless you've lied, cheated, stole, or didn't try hard. Because you become part of a system, and in fact, the valley works unbelievably well because you can be part of a company that fails and actually the next day park in the same place and go into the same building and sit in the same Herman Miller chairs that were purchased in 2000. And that is why failure has no consequence in human capital terms. Okay, so what's the process? All opportunities begin as a hypothesis. Uncertainty about people, about markets, pricing, cost, all this stuff. Entrepreneurs get a little bit of financial, human, and physical capital to run an experiment, a test. Investors only give them enough money to run a test. Why? Investors have learned that if an entrepreneur says they need $10 million to accomplish something, 
and you give them $10 million, they will spend all $10 million and then ask for more. I have yet to, I've only had one entrepreneur out of the 190 say, this is not working, I'm going to give the money back before I spend it. So investors wisely say, show me a milestone, show me something you can do that would reveal whether or not this is a good idea that's actually going to work. An experiment reveals some significant value-changing information on the basis of which you modify what you're doing, you step on the gas, or you stop completely. Money is time, not time is money. Ventures raise money to buy time. Ventures are in the production of information business. Investors are in the acquisition of information business. That's the very nature of entrepreneurship. Okay. Uh, the venture capital model is, you know, one of these things where there used to be a debate, do you want great people or do you want great ideas? And I'm reminded of the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie, you know, where Indiana Jones has some guy and the guy pulls out a sword and you expect Indiana Jones to pull out a sword. No, he shoots him. <laughs> or Jeff Bezos. No, I won't go there. But the fact is you want both. You want great people, great ideas. If you don't start with great in either dimension, you have to keep changing the cards you have in order to make it both. So investors then try to work on the resource side. And they give you enough money to prove something. They try to recruit and be helpful. Those are the best investors. Everyone says they're a, venture, a, venture, a value-added investor. And about 10% get the number right, the sign right. So it's not everywhere. Uh, so now, the other thing I want to just comment on is this. This is, uh, of course, entirely opaque. But this says, for a bunch of investments, 636, that a billion two put into those companies turned into three billion, 62% of the cash that was invested resulted in a large loss or total write-off. And out at the other end, 3% of the money that was invested resulted in 53% of the $3 billion that was created. So what does that tell you? That tells you that failure is a fundamental part of investing in backing these experiments. Sadly, you don't get the right-hand tail of the distribution, we'll call that Facebook and Google and other things, if you don't also buy the left-hand tail. I would much rather only buy the right-hand tail. But as I said before, I have a large representation of the left-hand tail. The fundamental idea here is without risk, there is no reward. That distribution has changed materially in the 80s. That distribution was a 35% loss. But the possibilities on the upside were much more constrained because we didn't have 7 billion customers that we could deal with or as in Facebook end up with 1.7 billion people connected. So the possibilities are much greater on that end. Um, okay. Uh, this also is intended to say in that cash flow curve where we invest in order to get future returns, I try to time each round of financing to have a big valuation improvement because I proved that the customers are going to buy or that my costs are reasonable. That's what I'm doing. And the other uh, thing of the entrepreneurial process that we often uh, need to take into account, Mike Porter, this is where I quote Mike Porter, Mike said you have to have a differentiated product or a better cost, or both, right? If you don't, you can't charge premium prices, you can't create and capture value, you need scale economies to do that. This is going to apply to education ventures. Network effects really help where the value of the network uh, goes up exponentially as you add members of the network arithmetically. You ultimately need barriers to entry, although in your business, I'm not sure socially the concept of barriers to entry is exactly right, uh, but certainly in most businesses you do. And 
most of what's going to change the world is because you ended up in the right-hand tail of that distribution. And again, you can't get there without exploring the left-hand tail and coming perilously close. You know, I remember uh, Jonathan Bush started a birthing center in California, and the birthing center wasn't going to work out. But they had observed that the software to run a doctor's office was horrible, and so they created software and built something called Athena Health. But they came so close to bankruptcy that you could taste it before they found the right path. So I, I just thought I'd talk about a few companies because um, I think they illustrate some parts of the entrepreneurial process. Let me skip Amazon for a second. How many people use Uber? Great. Um, why? Easy. Didn't know what Lyft was, yes. Uh, you and Mike Maples uh, have the same sort of common... Uh, okay, so uh, Mike Maples, a venture capitalist who did invest, uh, his firm invested in Lyft. Mike has this saying that people increasingly walk into his office and say, I'm going to describe an idea, and I just want you to know it's illegal. No, I'm sorry, what do you mean it's illegal? Well, it sort of violates every law. <laughs> but we're going to do it really quickly. And consumers are going to love the service so much that the political forces, the beast, can't beat it back. So I think if you look at Uber and you say, what was the entrenched competition? Were these taxi uh, uh, companies, they had medallions, they had drivers who never made eye contact. Uh, never really paid uh, any attention. Mean, the routes they went on were sort of haphazard, uh, didn't necessarily know what traffic was, didn't know where everything was. And all of a sudden, you come up with a compelling, compelling consumer proposition, and it destroys the entrenched interest. Now, they're fighting back, by the way. Uh, so if you go to uh, cities around the world, I was in Vancouver the other day, not so much. Uber says... Uh, contact your local politician, uh, which it does in some cities. But that's an example where a customer-driven, outcome-based solution buttressed with software ends up capturing a disproportionate share of the market. How did they begin? How did uh, Garrett and Travis begin? Not uh, in the way Michael described with Lyft as a social mission, they began, God, we're stuck in the rain in Paris and we can't get a black car. It's like, life is horrible, man. So they thought about maybe we could get black cars at a discount. And that was what ultimately evolved, but only because the first experiment revealed that it was a much more a greater possibility than even they imagined. And then as you see Uber Pool and Uber black car and Uber delivery, all of these things are subsequent experiments that are ca they're capable of doing because they have the platform and the network effects. You know, Jeff Bezos is fond of pointing out that his business plan didn't survive the first 60 days of contact with reality. In the first 60 days, he had orders from 60 countries. He had no idea that he had a global business. And if you look at Jeff, he also had written down a list of 20 products he thought were amenable to web sales, starting with books. Where's John Ingram? Um, and he had a particular way to do this. And the experiment worked. And then he went to CDs. And then he went to... And then, by the way, he went to everything. What do you think the most critical decision Jeff Bezos made was? Name is good. Didn't start out that way. He raised a million dollars from friends and family. By the way, this is the definition of friends and family, because if you raise the million and lose it, they are no longer friends nor family. <laughs> but, but you get them in Amazon, you're, pretty, you're set for life. He then had hired Joy Covey, who ended up raising $2 billion, and that changed everything. 
but I'll describe his business model. It turns out one of the most important decisions he ever made was to have a single store page. By which I mean you can go and you can buy from Amazon or you can buy from 47th Street Photo or you can buy from a small company somewhere in the Midwest. What retailer do you know who wants to give prime location in their store to their competition? No one. So what he did was he effectively crushed the competition because he said, oh, just come to one place. And then he did prime. Prime is transformative. Everyone told him he was going to go bankrupt. And then the other thing that I want to make sure everyone understands about Amazon, when do you pay when you buy something from Amazon? Up front, when does he pay his suppliers? 60 days. Now, it turns out, and he also doesn't have fancy stores, he's got these warehouses, so he has little capital expenditure. So he runs a $120 billion business with negative capital. In other words, if you take inventory plus accounts receivable plus prepaid minus accounts payable uh, and add in net plant and equipment, that number is negative. Now, if you're at Barnes & Noble, you need a dollar of assets to support a dollar of sales because you have to have 125,000 books in each one. How many people read those books? No one. No one has ever, I don't, they don't have to have any words in them. <laughs> but you have to have them. Best Buy holds its inventory in electronics for seven weeks. He holds it for two weeks. Inventory in electronics declines in value 1% per week. So you want to know why he's crushing it? It's because he runs more experiments and has extended his brand more effectively than anyone in the world, which is why Amazon is worth more than Walmart. And we've had some great discussions about whether they're nice. And I mean that. That is, are, is it nice to work there? Do, you, do they treat their employees great? Uh, is it uh, different from Costco? And I, I guess what I would say is, if it gets bad, people will leave, and he will crash and burn like everyone before him who has figured out how to alienate employees. So we'll watch. And if you want to start a company like Ron Johnson, where you go to enjoy in California, you see a very different kind of culture uh, being created by Ron. I want to talk about Satellogic because it's an il illustration of what's going on in the world in entrepreneurship. Satellogic was started by a young man named Emiliano Cargaman. He grew up in Buenos Aires. He ran away from home when he was 15. He taught himself how to program. He started his first company when he was 16. Eventually, he comes to the U.S. He starts a security software company. And then he decides to take a different path. And he goes to Singularity University. Peter Diamandis and uh, Ray Kurzweil and this interesting group of people. And he decides he's going to start a satellite company. I don't know how this works. I don't know how you decide I'm going to do satellites when you're not a rocket scientist, as we heard before. And so what does he do? He says the U.S. spends $100 million, $200 million to create an imaging satellite and launch it up into the uh, orbit. Why does it cost $100 million? I can go to Radio Shack or Alibaba, and I can buy all of these pieces, and if I add them all up, his cost of the equivalent satellite is $100,000, not $100 million. Now, that's a 1,000-fold improvement. So, he has software engineers in Buenos Aires. He has manufacturing in Montevideo. He has data analytics in Tel Aviv. He launches the rockets in Russia or India. And he has an office in Palo Alto. And the money came from Tencent in China. This is the world in which we now operate, in which the idea, the money, the production, the sales, the human capital, 
all have been disentangled. And so when you think about what's going to happen around the world, people are going to do this where they don't know it shouldn't cost $100,000. He's launched four of these satellites. He will be able to take a picture of every meter of the inhabited earth every five minutes. And we'll be able to tell people, well, if you look over here in this corner of your farm property, you have weeds, but you're putting Roundup on all of your property. You should just put it over there in the corner. Or you're short of water, and we saw this before with a picture of a combine. All of these things, I'll do Iora next. Iora is in healthcare. If you look at a typical doctor's office, primary care doctor, they have a doctor, half a nurse, and two accountants. That's a doctor. When you go to the doctor, you'll see them filling in all sorts of paperwork. Currently, a doctor has to spend two hours a day filling in paperwork so they can get paid. This young man, Rashika Fernandopule from Sri Lanka, said, well, what if instead of a that configuration, I had a doctor, a nurse, and four health coaches. And I wasn't paid for delivering services in a fee-for-service world, but I took twice as much as they typically get for primary care, and I focused on health outcomes, not on inputs. And I had my health coaches go out into the community to work with people to help them become compliant with their blood pressure medicine and with their um, blood glucose readings. And so, and then I had a team approach where I have a huddle every morning talking about the patients who are coming in that day or the patients who didn't come in or the patients where I've created the technology system that's not about billing and getting paid. It's about analyzing health and outcomes and trying to figure out where there might be a problem and how you could be helpful. And it lowers the cost of health care by 25% over a period as short as a year. It's all about reconceptualizing, not doing something inside the system that can't actually take place because the entire system is created a culture and a way of doing business in which the patient and their family actually play no role. I discovered in Florida that there are a lot of old people, uh, which is why I was in Florida. Uh, and you go to a doctor's office, and it's daughters and old people. And then I said, well, that's, that's, that's tough. Well, it turns out in Medicare, they only reimburse you for treating one condition per visit. And so what happens is you go, they treat you for one condition. Almost every old person has five. So they have to make another appointment to go back. And it turns out the job of old people is to go to the doctor. So you have this great match of supply and demand in Florida, but all corrupt because it's unrelated to the health of that person or to anything associated with reasonable um, activities. So I'll just go through. You all know Kip and Khan. Khan is a wonderful story only because it began with the simplest of experiments. Can I help my niece learn math. And then couldn't sync it up, so did this asynchronous thing, and then it grew and it grew, and, and uh, there's this great story about Andor uh, sending in $100,000 uh, because she's found this place, and, and Sal, the previous largest donation was 10. So he call, <laughs> called her up. Uh, or it's $10,000, I think, was the first uh, contribution. Anyway, she called up to have a long conversation. And then uh, she says, well, are you paying yourself a salary? No, I'm not paying myself. My wife's working. And so she sent 100000 And then if you look at the experimental structure of Khan, including going on today, it's all about this, how do I acquire resources in order to do the next thing. I have to figure out, can I create a dashboard for students? Can I figure out a way to help implement elements of this curriculum inside school systems? All of the experiments that people in this room are currently running, that all are trying to do the same thing, which is to change outcomes. Change outcomes.
and then structure the experiments for people. Think of investors as customers. You're selling them something. They could be philanthropists, they could be venture capitalists, but you're selling them that you're going to produce information on the basis of which they're going to be willing or someone else is going to be willing to give you money to go out and capture value in this meaningful way. So um, I think the, the, the most important thing here is, and I could go through scores of examples, Oscar is about Control-Alt-Delete in health insurance. It's a bunch of 25-year-olds who decided to create a new mobile-based uh, teledoc intervention health insurance system. You went to their office. It was a whole bunch of young people and then three or four 50-year-olds from the insurance industry. That company has now raised, I think, four or five hundred million dollars and is having this incredible assault on the insurance industry and everyone in the insurance industry is trying to crush them. So, for example, even the regulators call them up and say, we know that you got a bunch of young people in your system and, gee, that's terrific, but we're going to allocate these sicker people to you. So the very thing you would like people to do, which is to compete based on the quality of their service and the like, actually is precluded in the healthcare industry. And I think as we look at education, you'll see uh, similar kinds of battles. So here's the question. Where are they? Where are the truly scalable network effects, series of experiments that will end up having the impact that Amazon or Uber, or ultimately companies like Satellogic have. How can we generate a revolution? I want to go back to what I said before, which is all of the current narrative is false, misleading, and has no positive suggestions for change in it. It's describing a set of causes and outcomes that are much more correlations than they are causal. And the search in the world is really for understanding causation, not correlation. So when I say incomes in middle America are squeezed, that's not because people are doing well, except to the extent that they're doing well for the 800 million people who came into the workforce uh, someplace else. Um, and then how should we raise and allocate capital for experiments. I think there's just a, um, a fascinating typo. Uh, but, but beyond that, who's going to finance this? So Gates, for example, has a model. Gates is trying to figure out ways to run experiments. If you talk to people who are here from Gates, they're trying to figure out how to allocate capital in global health and in education and in other areas in which they can produce information on the basis of which they do something different. Is that the best way to allocate the capital? Where are the venture capitalists who get to know this area and can be helpful as people experiment and run, uh, try to produce information? And I, I think one other critical element of this is we have to be out of the business of fearing failure. In healthcare and education, we say, oh my God, I couldn't sacrifice a person. I couldn't sacrifice a kid. If you don't have risk, you will not get progress. And a lot of what we see in the current system is an attempt to eliminate risk. So, for example, in financial regulation, you will observe that trying to protect everyone from risk will also ultimately protect them from reward. And the very system that has created all of these companies and these possibilities is going to go away. Uh, I'm happy to talk about this. Uh, happy to talk about that, but I did want to end. I haven't told them yet about all the other crap. <laughs> I'm happy to respond to any questions. Oh.